Hi guys and welcome to Quick Guides for Medicine, short videos designed to help you get your mind around things to learn in internal medicine. My name is Fatai and I'm a current third year internal medicine resident at Brookdale University Hospital Medical Center. We're picking up from where we left off the last time. We talked about unstable angina, we talked about anstemi. Today we're talking about STEMI. Uh, we'll break it in small portions, the diagnosis, some portions of the treatment, and we'll go on and talk about additional treatments and uh, complications. Remember, for every diagnosis that we mentioned so far, there's three things I want you to really start with, the basic stuff. I know it sounds simple, but again, I keep repeating it. You hear a diagnosis, first thing you ask yourself is, how does it present? How do I recognize this disease if the patient is walking to my emergency room? How does it present, all right? Second thing, how do you test? How do you confirm that particular diagnosis? Third thing, how do you treat it? These are basic you know, tenets of clinical medicine, wherever you go. The reason why I keep emphasizing these basic things is there's just so many things to learn in medicine and a lot of times if you don't keep it simple, it's very easy to get overwhelmed and I, I, it's just, I've been down there, I've been, I've been, I've been frustrated about, you know, how many things it is there is to learn and it's just really overwhelming sometimes. So I just try to keep it as simple as possible. So without saying too much, let's get right to it. Um, obviously there'll be other things that would be tested, you know, you know, risk factors and follow-ups and all of that, but you just want to keep it as simple as possible. So the topic here is STEMI. Okay. All right. So let's say the patient, um, what do we expect in terms of the presentation for STEMI? All right. We're saying again, typical chest pain. Typical chest pain. There's um, not all chest pain is going to be acute coronary syndrome, like we already mentioned. You know, we're expecting this pain to be um, substernal. You know, radiating most likely. Um, you know, more important than that though is is uh, more important to say for sure it is likely acute coronary syndrome. Like we already mentioned, is the fact that this pain is non-reproducible. Right. Uh, because if it was most likely musculoskeletal uh, uh, problem there, or this pain it does not change with movement, you know, whether they're breathing or sitting in a particular position, it doesn't change the pain. It's, it's you know, acute coronary syndrome pain is going to be there regardless. All right, so we say we know this is typical chest pain uh, for acute coronary syndrome. What's the next thing we do? Obviously, we have to test, right? We get our EKG, boom. What do we expect to see in the EKG in a patient having STEMI? Um, very clear, very clear indications here. For STEMI, we expect ST segment elevation of more than, you know, or equal to one millimeter, all right, from baseline in two or more contiguous leads. Plus some um, uh, reciprocal changes as well. So what I referred, what I'm referring to is, for example, if there's you know um, ST segment elevation in some group of leads, you have ST depression in some adjacent leads. Uh, that's what we're basically referring to here. Um, in addition to that, there's some of the there's some of the EKG findings that by themselves uh, can be uh, regarded as equivalent for uh, STEMI. What are those? left bundle branch block there's some you know question about right bundle branch block becoming also um an indication but what we know so far clearly is the left bundle branch block is considered um uh, an equivalent for STEMI um what else if for example you find ST depression ST segment depression in uh V1 to V3 be careful because you might very well be dealing with posterior MI here all right, so you may want to flip that EKG, you know, upside down to be able to see actually the uh, ST elevation in those leads. So again, S segment elevation of more than one millimeter into a more continuous leads with reciprocal changes or left bundle branch block or SC segment depression um, in V1 to V3 may actually be suggestive of a posterior MI. So now that we know that, the question though is, do we make... Do we wait for cardiac enzymes to make a diagnosis of um, of a STEMI? Uh, no, no. We can test for it, we can send it, but do we don't necessarily have to wait for it, all right? So with the 
symptoms and the EKG findings, we can definitely make a diagnosis of STEMI. So let's assume here we made a diagnosis of STEMI and we activate the STEMI code. Um, what do we do? We know eventually the things that are most benefit, the, the most important thing in the management of this disease is to get PCI or in some facilities that don't have PCI, you definitely get TPA. But before then, you're seeing this patient emergency, what else can you do? Most important thing you can do for this patient at that particular time is actually to start them on dual antiplatelets. All right, so again, your aspirin plus uh, ticagrelor or clopidogrel. All right, or even uh, Prasugrel, but Prasugrel will be for sure if you know you're getting a PCI. But ideally, in terms of, you know, best choices, it will be aspirin and ticagrelo. Um, That's what you want to be looking at. All right, so you start them on that. Do you need to start full dose anticoagulation? Maybe yes or maybe not. If you know you're doing the PCI right away, which should be the case, you may not necessarily need that. But if you want to, you can definitely do something. You can you can do Lovenox. You can do I mean you can do low molecular weight heparin, um, or or uh, the um, unfractionated heparin as well. Right. But because you know these guys may eventually um, worsen bleeding risk with the procedure, sometimes they say, you know what, just hold it. The dual antiplatelets are the most important thing. So if there's something you have to do before you take them into the cath lab, for sure the dual antiplatelets. All right, for sure the dual antiplatelets. All right, so back to the main things now, right? PCI is what we expect to be done, all right? We expect the PCI to be done. Remember, time is muscle, right? We expect PCI to be done within 90 minutes of the patient um, arrival to the, to, to the hospital, right? Door to balloon time, remember that, 90 minutes. Or if you have a PCI facility nearby, Assuming you're in a facility that doesn't have PCI capabilities, if you have PCI uh, a facility nearby, let's say there's a PCI facility within 120 minutes, that is still viable. So if you're doing in your center, 90 minutes is the, the, the goal. If you're able to get to that other facility within 120 and you expect the PCI to be done within 120 minutes, that's definitely another uh, consideration. You should definitely get a PCI in that case. If you can't get either of these two, you definitely will be able to give your TPA. The contraindications for TPA will be two most important things. Um, patient that is, you know, actively bleeding or recent massive bleed, right? You definitely know they're most likely going to bleed. So you will be, you know, you will have to consider actually doing TPA. But let's say that's not the case. Let's say they don't have any contraindications for TPA, clearly. Um, you do TPA. TPA can be given within 12 hours of their arrival. So that's, that's a, a good one. And it's important to know that not all facilities actually have PCI. It's getting more common now, but um, it's, there's still some facilities within the country that definitely won't have uh, PCI capabilities. So you want to be able to uh, make the right decisions with TPA. Okay. There's so many other medications we're definitely going to do after the PCI. So we'll use the other video, the next video, to talk about that. I'll see you on the next video. Thanks for watching.